well, uh, welcome everybody to our banking as a service uh, uh, panel. I'm really excited about uh, this session. I think it's going to be a great conversation. Uh, we have uh, lo lovely in to do from uh, Bank Mobile, uh, Nigel Verdon from Rails Bank, and uh, Jill Gade from Cross River Bank. Um, so, uh, uh, why don't I start start the conversation? Um, with you, Jill, um, if you could, uh, you know, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then uh, I think it'd be interesting to begin the discussion um, by just defining what we mean um, by banking as, uh, and uh, and talking about the, the difference between um, banking as a service and open banking, and if you if you see a difference, Jill, I'd love to hear your your perspective on that. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to try not to take uh, because this this is a uh, a, a very um, um, you know charged subject. So just really briefly yeah. about and, and, um, yeah, tell, yeah. Please tell us about yourself and Cross no, River. Uh, no, no uh, problem as well. So, so I, I found that I come from uh, Paris, France originally. I came to uh, the U.S. about uh, close to 30 years ago. I founded the bank in 2008 in the midst of a financial debacle. Um, with a pledge to try to make a difference and to change a little bit the way that banking was going to be conducted or perceived, uh, particularly from a consumer standpoint and small business standpoint. And then fast forward, we were very fortunate uh, to onboard a number of uh, partnerships with the fintech community, uh, particularly on the marketplace lending side and on the payment side. Um, marketplace lending side, uh, you know, onboarded uh, folks like... Uh, Upgrade, Upstart, the Rocket Loans, Marlette, um, a firm, obviously, a big client of ours. And uh, on the payment side, uh, we process transactions uh, with vast majority of, uh, of, of uh, all payment rails, accessibility to payment rails with folks like uh, Google Wallet, uh, Coinbase, um, Plaid, and many others. Um, now to uh, just answer your question really briefly, uh, what we perceive as bank as a service being is to provide the um, a solution to folks that are non-banks that would like to offer a banking service to their customers in any shape or form. And it could be either a, a lending product or it could be a deposit product, it could be a transactional product. Um, we uh, endeavor to provide all three together. Now, um, you could have a front end or you don't necessarily have to have a front end. Our preference is for you to develop your own front end because we're not specializing in that. Um, our pledge is that we're not going to compete with you. And that means that the, the fact that we're not front-end specialists, we provide accessibility to payment rails. We provide the omnibus account. We provide the ability for you to, um, in a scalable manner, into the tune of hundreds of thousands of accounts uh, to open accounts on behalf of your customers, whether they be uh, small businesses or, um, or consumers. Um, big difference with open banking, obviously, Open banking is, uh, you know, the uh, portability of data, uh, of bank data from uh, one account to another so that um, any company could have actually have access to that data and enable that company to analyze the data and provide you with the best service possible. Um, so we believe that there is a step forward to that and you need inevitably and invariably, particularly in the U.S., you still need the bank to gain access to the um uh to the uh the payment rails in order to execute certain transactions um on the lending side as well um the us is very bank driven for banking transactions and lending transactions that's just the nature of the beast here not so much so in the uk and i'm sure you can ask the same questions from Nigel, obviously uh but this is in a nutshell this is uh, the way we view the world great thanks um uh Lovely, and uh, I would love it if you, if you could go next and uh, share a little bit about yourself, um, about uh, about Bank Mobile, um, and uh, and then just talk to us uh, a little bit about how you've seen um, the fintech ecosystem evolving over these. Sure. So, um, you know, Bank Mobile is one of the largest and fastest growing digital banks in the country. Uh, today, we have over 2 million account holders and, and are opening hundreds of thousands of accounts a year and on a trajectory to, to be a million accounts a year as, as our run rate through our strategy. Uh, that puts us in the top 15 banks today in terms of number of consumer checking accounts that we have opened. 
Um, and we're really focused on how do we help those that are most underserved today in, in the banking system, middle income Americans, lower income Americans, but have really straddled um, the whole gamut now and, and also, you know, being able to help mass affluent customers as well have a better banking experience. And how are we doing that today? It, it is through banking as a service. And, and, and um, Jill, you did a great job of sort of describing the difference. We are definitely in the segment of banking as a service. And really, you know, why is this, um, you know, so important? I think that companies are continuously looking at how do you continue to attract, engage, and retain customers. And offering financial services is definitely one way for them to be able to continue to attract, engage, and, and retain customers. And we help provide them the backbone, the infrastructure, the technology, the end-to-end, -end. so meaning the technology, the charter, and then the back-end servicing from compliance, from fraud management, the core processor, debit card issuance, customer care, you name it. And I think that you asked, you know, what has changed in the last few months, and it's really how do these companies continue to have strong connections with their customers? How do they get greater engagement, greater loyalty when it's really, really needed? And we're hoping that financial services is one way to help them do that. And, and that's what we're in the business of helping them do. Great. Um, and uh, Nigel, I'm going to kick it to you. I'm going to ask you um, to tell us a little bit about Currency Cloud. Uh, so we have a full lay of uh, the land of your perspective on a fintech space. And then, of course, uh, uh, we want to hear about Rails Bank. Um, and then uh, and then I'm going to put the same question to you also to um, give us your views on, on what's been happening in the ecosystem in the last few months. You might be on mute, Nigel. Uh, apologies, apologies. I'm uh, sure. I'm sure what you're saying though was uh, was lovely. Okay, I'll try to remember what it was. Uh, so uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Wells Bank, and also as the founder of Currency Cloud. Uh, Wells Bank's mission, uh, just so to be clear, is uh, to enable anybody to become a fintech, whether you're a brand or whether you're a fintech yourself. So that's that's where we focus. Uh, Wells Bank was born out of uh, the frustrations that uh, we had when building out Currency Cloud. We had uh, my colleagues, Tav and Christo, I guess, had also when they built uh, TransferWise. Uh, other colleagues built Asimo and most of that wave that came through in 2011, 2012 of the early stage of, sort of FinTech 1.0. Uh, and that was, uh, and it's, it was also when Monzo and others were setting up, of the to go into market took you about nine to 12 months before you could take a customer on board and start revenueing. And that normally costs around 2 million bucks or so of, uh, of infrastructure cost. And so when you'd have to do that in each country and to be able to launch, we thought there was a better way. And we decided to build Rails Bank to deliver that better way where you can take a customer and be live uh, between six to eight weeks. Uh, you lift and shift to a new country is a similar sort of sign. And when you're uh, just going by the economics, are a lot, lot cheaper than, up to 10 times cheaper than the 2 million bucks you would have uh, originally spent. And so our definition of banking service is very similar to, to everybody here. It's uh, offering uh, a couple of uh, very fundamental capabilities, which is is issuing accounts, and whether they're called different things in different countries, sending money, receiving money uh, as those core bank as a service products. We see cards as a service of helping issue cards with a credit or debit, uh, authorizing, so in, in being involved in the authorization and spending money on the cards, controlling cards. We see compliance as a service of where you provide the regulation uh, and the all the other transaction monitoring, all the pieces you need to do ongoing KYC, because KYC doesn't just start at the beginning, it's continually uh, seeing how a customer behaves over their the lifetime. And then there's other products we're, we're just launching at the end of this year, which is credit as a service, uh, where we're helping with the underwriting, pulling a load of data and all the data we have on, on the platform of and then third party data and underwriting tools, uh, portfolio management, delinquency management tools, etc. So we see all that together as more banking as a service growing out to financial services as a service and as a trend uh, that 
where they where will they uh, I, I don't mean to insult Lynn and, and, and Shield here we're just plumbers uh, we're, we're they're doing the plumbing the utility and allowing other people to build uh, bathrooms and kitchens everything on top of us we're just uh, the humble plumbers um, that's great and you know like the, your story um, with you know being a, a multi multiple time founder in fintech I think it's um, it, you know, we've seen some instances of it. I think well, it'll continue to get more and more common because um, fintech, fintech really begets more fintech. Of uh, my partner at Treasury, Jeff Cruttenden, uh, his uh, first company, Acorns, uh, and some of the frustrations they had at Acorns led to Jeff's second company, Say. Um, they had a lousy experience uh, uh, with one particular piece of the plumbing um, and delivering proxy and shareholder voting and start a, a whole new company to, to fix that problem. Um, Jill, I, I, you know, you all sit at uh, Cross River across so much of the fintech ecosystem. Um, and I think you've, you've remained very disciplined. Um, I think about, you know, it's just swimming in, in, in two main lanes, but I wonder if you often have temptation you have such a great perch um, to branch into new businesses or, or even start a new company. Um, no, I think um, I, I got served a, my, um, a decent amount of share of, uh, of regulatory compliance framework um, in my first entrepreneurial endeavor. So I don't think I'm ready for another one right now, just quite yet. Um, so we, we have a lot to propose and a lot to do and a lot to continue to build. Um, we really enjoying what we're doing and, um, and there, there's just so much uh, to accomplish still. Um, the, the demand is, is um, you know, yeah. really significant. Um, I would say uh, the, the market will really drive the amount of products and services that we um, get into. Um, whether it be on the asset class, you know, that we're going to continue to diversify or on the payment side, um, you know, I believe that we have a, a decent portfolio of products and services at this stage, but the innovators will determine whether that's sufficient or not. Um, and when they come to us and they say, do you have such a, and such product for us to be able to deliver the best service possible to our customers? And if we say no, then we'll say, you know what, um, just give us 90 days and we'll make sure to be able to develop it. Uh, we built a very agile core processor, um, a core engine that enables us to, to uh, configure in any use case possible um, by just uh, almost a plug and play. It's just... Uh, uh, something that we're very proud of and um, um, which we, we would like to continue to put at the contribution of the, uh, the clients and customers of our customers. Just thinking about the, the lending side of your business and, and the different asset is, um, that you're supporting, um, have you seen, um, you know, do you, at least you have observations on uh, which types of have been um, thriving in, in the midst of pandemic and which types of asset classes are having perhaps a pullback or are seeing some struggles? So that's a very interesting question. I think it's a little bit too early to determine. Uh, so far, we've been pleasantly surprised across asset classes. Um, I I would venture to say that uh, um, so far we're, we haven't had to adjust um, our uh, projections too dramatically. We obviously saw a dip in um, in uh, in productivity, however, um, that's uh, predominantly due to a tightening of the credit box, not necessarily because people are more frugal. Um, as we could see, like for example, our um, you know our company, our partner firm, has experienced an exponential growth, and that's just the reason is uh, very simply because people have pivoted away from the stores and into an online shopping experience. Um, so as this continues, there's no reason for us to believe that. This is going to this is going to decrease anytime soon. So um, there are there may be certain asset classes that may suffer during this pandemic. Um, right now, it looks like the economy is very resilient. People are very resilient. Um, obviously, the uh, the grants and the uh, the advances that have been uh, provided by the government have helped uh, to some extent. We have to see if there is sustainability in that business model. Obviously, great. Um... Well, Blaine, I'd love to uh, shift back to um, Beck Mobile for uh, an, another few minutes. Uh, there's been such an astronomical increase in uh, 
consumer facing financial technology and are, are really at, at the heart of it. Um, uh, I'm curious about partnerships and um, you know how they have played a role in, in your growth. Uh, I know you have a, a partnership, I believe, with, with T-Mobile. Uh, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about um, uh, the impact of that partnership on your business and any others that uh, seem essential. Sure, Eli, can you hear me? It's really unfortunate, but I've been having some major issues. Are we good now? Oh, thank God. <laughs> okay, <laughs> apologize for that. Um, yeah, no, we our whole um, our whole strategy is based on partnerships, and and today we have partnerships with 800 campuses across the country. One in every three college-bound students goes to one of those schools. So that provides us, you know, ample opportunity for customer acquisition and brand awareness and creating a customer for life um, when someone is, you know, very young and getting them into our, um, you know, a relationship very young and growing with them. In terms of T-Mobile, that's a second very large partnership that we have. And today with T-Mobile, you know, I don't talk much about that partnership. They are a public company and, and they like to sort of own the narrative about their strategy as well. But at a high level, it's what I said before, which is companies want to partner with us because they are looking at how to create, attract, engage, and retain customers better. And financial services is one main strategy to do that. And T-Mobile, you know, before they'd be like, hey, you can get free GoGo -Go in-flight, you can get free Netflix, and let's add, you know, a free bank account and create synergies between that bank account and their wireless experience to make it even more valuable to the customer. And you know what is banking as a service? We're not just providing APIs to plug in so they can do account opening, et cetera, but we really create a customized experience for T-Mobile customers, whether they're coming in from the store channel and signing up for wireless and simultaneously we're able to do an eligibility check for the bank account and, and they can open a bank account in store right there. Um, so you know the partnerships are really important to us to get access to millions of customers and and to be able to acquire customers at very low cost traditional banks are you know 300 to 1500 dollars to acquire our customers today we're acquiring customers in five to ten dollars and it's really because of our model of partnering with with campuses and partnering with t-mobile and we have a very strong pipeline uh you know for, to be able to roll out with other partners as well so we both it's a win-win we get to acquire customers at high volume at low cost and they really get to help attract, engage, and retain customers by offering very compelling, customized uh, financial services products. That's great. Uh, and you know, you, classic sort of um, startup uh, tech startup dynamics question for you, just to follow up. Uh, how do you how do you make sure to maintain discipline around along um, around your roadmap, um, building technology that is scalable and reusable? Um, well, that you know, you're building the things that are, are most valuable um, uh, to, to your biggest partners? You know, that's a great question. I think it's because the fundamental uh, foundation of what we built is, is the same between partner to partner. Um, you know, Jill talked about, you know, building a, a core that is very agile and can really plug in. You know, we've done the same where we actually use a core today that is it's an FIS core, so nothing you know shiny about that, but it has a robustness about it. And we've built a hub on top of that that really creates that customer centric centric uh, experience that we can share partner to partner, and that's all housed in the cloud. And so you can sort of print a bank, and and to be able to create the foundations is the same for each partner that we work with. But then we can create a layer of customization that is very unique for our large partners that are looking for a unique experience, whether that's coming into a retail channel and being able to open an account, whether that's at point of sale and creating sort of buy one, get one free, um, you know, with the bank account and getting the rebate in there right away. Uh, so we have the best of both worlds where we have the stability and robustness of a core. We have the hub, what we call it, which creates that customer centricity across all our partners that's housed in the cloud. And we can print, print a bank for our you know, each of our partners, but then we have the customization layer that really makes it unique for each partner. Um, related question that I'm gonna throw out to all of you. Uh, so some of you have raised money from strategic investors. Uh, maybe just put your hand up if you have, because um, I'm curious about, you know, it, for FinTech, um, 
that uh, that decision um, to um, to have a, a a capital relationship with a with a big strategic. So, Nigel, I'd love for you to talk us through since you raised your hands um, about that decision, and uh, Jill and Loveline, if, if it's a if it's a decision that, that you faced, uh, then please jump in after Nigel. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think it's more the question of the right capital for the company. Uh, and a strategic investor is, is very useful for one, uh, access uh, and focus uh, of uh, their attention uh, to, towards you. Uh, we work very close with Visa in Southeast Asia because uh, uh, I should have mentioned earlier on, we're the only uh, banking platform or banking service business that's live in the UK, Europe, Southeast Asia and about to go live in the US. Uh, the, that relationship with Visa is to help Visa uh, enter the Southeast Asian markets uh, with p delivering their, their Visa Direct, so not Visa Direct, the Visa Fast Track program. Uh, and so it's a win win situation. So that gets our attention, it also gets uh, Visa attention on, on, onto us. We have other strategic relationships too, uh, where uh, companies are looking to, or brands are looking to, uh, develop financial services products and and want to make sure we're there for them as well as also being a, a, a customer as well as also being an investor. Uh, we had we put certain uh, conditions around this as well to make sure there isn't the the bear hug, if you see what I mean. So your roadmap, our roadmap is very precious to all our customers. We make sure the roadmap is is suitable for everybody because we're more sales force, we don't do customization, we do pure, these are a set of APIs and with our APIs you can build any use case that you can imagine. And that's the that's way we approach it, same way Stripe approached it on the on the card acquiring uh, world. So uh, strategic money is good if you, if you manage it uh, and also de deliver on the expectation of the of strategic investor. And it's the same with thing, you also decide whether you want uh, uh, venture money or long earn equity money as well, or PE money at different stages. Uh, they, they all have different caveats uh, on, the, on the cap structure uh, and uh, have advantages and disadvantages. And same if you want to take debt at some stage, which is, which is normal. So uh, I use it where it's useful, uh, but, but go in with your eyes open to understand the impact uh, to your customer uh, and to rest your customers everything. But one of the good thing is if you get good strategic investors, they know how to manage conflicts of interest as well. So obviously Visa's invest in us, but we also work closely with MasterCard uh, and we issue for, we're principal members of both uh, on the issuing side. And so it's, it's working out to, uh, to, to, to keep everybody happy in a non-conflicted way. And, and that's probably where the effort goes in rather than the money, if you see, if you see what I mean. Yep. Jill, lovely, and anything to add to that? Have either of you um, come closer, considered the idea of strategic investment? Um, as far as we're concerned, um, w one thing we experience is that every investor wants to be considered a strategic investor, um, whether they're financial VC, PE, or whatever the case may be. Uh, so make them believe that they're strategic um, at any given time. And, and then you're good to go. Uh, at the end of the day, there's nobody that will know your strategy, your vision than yourself. And, um, and, and I think the best people to execute it are the people that have the most vested interest, which is uh, the key managers and the management team and the employees. So um, I think the strategy starts there. Um, th that's where th this is the breeding ground of all the ideas of all the development, the execution. Um, and then obviously we're, you know, calling upon our partners or, um, you know, equity partners to help out um, once in a while, our board, obviously, but you, you're very rarely going to see a true impact from, uh, from those in, um, that are uh, participating in your capital because they have their own strategy to run, their, their own life to run. So it's a little bit difficult to, for them to focus on one company, particularly if they have um, multitudes of investments in their in their portfolio. Thanks. Um, maybe just to uh, turn back to the idea, Nigel spoke about his experiences a little bit. Um, uh, you know, there are certain areas of fintech that 
are not well suited to internationalization, or at least they're they're more difficult businesses um, to run across multiple markets. Um, uh, I'm curious to, to all of you, for all of you to comment on whether you think banking as a service is an area um, that is well suited um, to internationalization and um, and being a global company, or um, uh, or if uh, you know Nigel's experience is a bit of an outlier. I'll, I'll say it for my. It's, it's basically it's, on a, it's a question really about the size of market. U.S. market is a massive market by itself. Uh, so uh, what we've found is customers have as aspirations to, to go global, and so uh, or say start in the UK and then go out to uh, Germany, to France, to Spain, uh, uh, to Singapore, to Indonesia, to Philippines. So it's it's an important part of the roadmap of understanding. Uh, I'm building in one country and I want to launch another, but I don't want to have the complete lift and shift cost and starting from scratch and everything. So, so Monza went over to the US. I want to be in business fast. So that's for uh, customers on the growth curve. Uh, they want to buy into access new markets, super simple and fast. On, on existing customers who are big, who, who are, are global already, we have uh, discussions, uh, people who are live throughout Southeast Asia. And they want one integration uh, and one abstraction uh, to deliver the same service or deliver services in those countries. And we do all the localization for them. They just want to know, issue account, send money, receive money. Can you deliver that to me, Nigel? Uh, and we say, yep, the team will get together. We'll deliver that, that abstraction away and handle all the localization. So you have the same integration, UK, Europe, US, Singapore, Philippines, Indonesia, Australia, uh, Japan, all those markets, we, we can make look the same. And that's about democratizing access and uh, the, the, the systems and the, the processes and the capabilities are fundamentally different in a lot of countries. For example, in, uh, in uh, Philippines, uh, card acceptance isn't, isn't huge, but bizarre enough, a lot of people are paid on cards. Uh, so it's, it's a bizarre dynamic. Uh, in countries where you haven't got instant payments, you've got lots of payout cards like the US where payout cards don't really work in Europe and, and uh, UK because it's you have an instant payment mechanism. So, but you, you, they still fall down to a couple of core things, issue account, send money, receive money, issue card or credentials, uh, control of spend on that card. And when you look at them that way, you can build an international business that supports customers. The only reason we, we went international, uh, global from day one, was customers were asking us to do that. And uh, making it, they're saying we'd love to go to Europe, or we'd love to go to the US. And uh, and you will know very, very soon, we've got a pipeline of business uh, coming to coming to the US, and, and thanks to Jude and his team for helping out. So the, the, it's, it's, a, it's a segment that we service particularly well. If we want just to, to do a, a say a German centric product, Solaris is a great solution for you. But that's then suddenly realize you've got aspirations to go other markets and you need someone like us to, to abstract that in that better way. We have different models. So, just the one thing on, on our core markets like uh, UK and Europe, we have direct connectivity and clearing and everything right away to the central banks. Uh, and hold our, our money there. New markets, we've got a stack model, so we can put in somebody else's license, we put somebody else's memberships, uh, don't need to use RVs or, or MasterCard memberships. And so we can go live super fast. We lit up uh, Singapore uh, for Sing Live using their insurance license and uh, their Visa principal membership uh, with and had it launched uh, to, to market. So we have this sort of hybrid model, we can go totally software or we can go totally uh, deep regulated and operations in, in, into the market. So, so Nigel and Jill, you're, you're working together on the U.S. opportunity. Tell us a little bit about that partnership and you know what, what pieces you're, you're partnering. So our partnership I developed from a very, very kind gentleman called Philip Reese, who, uh, uh, as you will obviously know very well, is an angel investor in Rails Bank. I think that, that's what started the, the conversation an email a long while ago. We, we had aspirations to go to the US and uh, and uh, this conversation has gone on uh, for some time and Jill's been incredibly supportive in his team of, of helping us there. 
And, and by the way, it's reciprocal. So by the same token, uh, we will uh, rely on Rails Bank to help us uh, break out on the UK market, uh, offering some of our products or helping our customers um, to, um, to have a more international offering, um, both in the UK and in the rest of Europe. Well, uh, Philip is one of my favorite people in, in FinTech. It's great, great to hear he's uh, helped that partnership come together. Um, just a, 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 a few more minutes. So uh, I just wanted to touch on, on regulatory strategy um, before we wrap up and mobile and I'll ask you to start. Um, as you've, you know, I think every FinTech company needs to think about um, what pieces of the regulatory stack to own and what to, to partner or, 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 or borrow a license for. So, you know, how have you, how have you all approached that? I say we, we take customers on a on a journey, uh, and it, it works differently in different countries. I just use UK as a just illustrative of, of one journey. Is you start them uh, as being essentially an, an introducer to you, uh, and get them into market so they can start signing up customers and see if the value prop works. If the value prop works, they go on the next stage of the journey, start growing up, and they become an agent of us, and then they sign customers direct, and that we are supervisor. So we take the supervisor responsibility on top. And then when they grow up more and their value pot's working, they get their own license, they slot it into our stack and carry on. But the customer experience on the APIs uh, and everything is exactly the same. It's just different frequencies with the end consumer or an SME on there. So you see regulation is a part and parcel of this business. It, it is very different in, in, in every country. Uh, and, and I'm learning every day more about the US. But uh, the, the key thing is, it's getting people into business fast. And we'll use an example, uh, and I hope there's no NatWest people on the call, but Bo was, took 12 months to go to market and the value prop wasn't there and understood. And therefore they shut it down and lost about 11,000 customers. At the same time, we'd sign, we've got now 1.2 million at the same time, Bo took to go to market, we've got 1.2 million accounts open. Uh, and the, the key thing is use in a, in a well-supervised way because compliance is king and you, you have to uh, you, you have to work with the regulators, not against them and everything. Uh, to, and you have to respect them all, all, all as well. But, and take your customers on a journey, but allow them to get their value prop into a market super fast. So that they're successful, will be successful. It's mainly on the on the fintech segment, and it's the same thing on helping uh, brands. Uh, we have a, a, a major supermarket in the UK as a, a, is help them with a, a savings product, which stops uh, people defecting the brand and then going over to uh, a, a competitor when they have children. It's to do with uh, children's children's uh, uh, and stuff like that being uh, more expensive, more cheaper than the other supermarkets. We use savings as a method to keep them. They just didn't want anything to do with regulation whatsoever. And so we help them on that journey uh, to become, again, an agent. So they might sign them up, but under our supervision. So it's a super fast way of getting them to market as well. So it, it's a mass, it's one of the, it's one of the non-software tools within banking as a service and banking as a service, uh, come back to the other definition, software is part of it, regulation is part, operations are another part, journeys are another part. So all of that together, memberships and everything are a part of it. It's not just, it's just a software piece. Great. Lovely, and we'll, we'll end with you. Tell us what parts of the regulatory stack uh, Bank Mobile um, has chosen to own and uh, you know, what parts you, you might be partnering on and, and if you see that um, changing over time or um, if you're, you've are you kind of reached a steady state? Yeah, no, for, for us, we, we are a bank today and we have a bank charter regulatory, uh, you know, making sure that we keep that front and center as part of our DNA and our partners understand that. We educate them very much so on this process, um, all the way from product innovation, making sure that we have the regulatory sort of eyes and, and focus on how do we develop products, how do we develop features, in the beginning with regulation in mind, um, marketing and content approval streams as well is highly, you know, we have that insight from a regulatory standpoint um, and keeping the regulators abreast and even we co-meet. So, to, you know, our partners and I meet with regulators together uh, to, to make sure that they're on board and they understand the partnership and we work through things together. So 
really end to end, uh, we work in partnership, but at the end, the accountability and responsibility is on us as a bank. So we make sure that it's uh, part of every portion of our relationship. Great, thanks. Well, thank you, we're, we're out of time. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining today. Really a fascinating discussion. One, one of the, I think, most interesting uh, and, and clearly quickest growing areas uh, in, in all tech. Uh, so it's, it's great to have your, your thoughts and, and leadership in the space. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.